to ask that you open your Bible with me to Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to read verses 10 to 20 in a minute. But before I do that, I, I want to explain a little bit of why the project, I know, uh, or, or why this sermon, why this text, and I know some of you have questions regarding why a survey before the, the series. And so, just so you know, the purpose of the survey, more than just um, something that's required of me for, for what I'm writing about at, at, at school, I wanted to do the survey because the intent of it, more than just knowledge questions, is really to evaluate growth. So throughout the series, I want to evaluate, you know, based on what you answered in these past weeks on this survey, and, and I want to evaluate those answers and then look at them 10 weeks from now, which is why I'm asking you to pick a PIN number that, that you will remember 10 weeks from now so that I can match the two responses. But again, the intent is more than what's right and wrong is to see the growth in your life. If your prayer life has increased, you know, there were specific questions on temptation, specific questions on mental health. And I want to see how you now, after 10 weeks, feel about dealing with temptation and dealing with mental health. So that's really the purpose of the survey. And it's the reason why I'm doing the survey and I asked you to, to fill it out prior to beginning this series. So I'm thankful that you took time to do that. And again, I'm simply just measuring growth. So with that said, I want to read Ephesians 6, 10, to 20, and then I want to explain to you why I wanted to preach on the subject of the armor of God and spiritual warfare. So the text in Ephesians 6:10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil, even in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fasted on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Out of... All the changes that we've done at church throughout these years, we've covered many subjects. Throughout these years, we've talked about the doctrine of election, the doctrine of predestination, the doctrines of grace. We've, we've gone through eschatology, proper ecclesiology. We, you've noticed some changes in sermon approach as far as shifting from thematic to expository preaching. And as I was thinking, what are some of the things we have yet to cover? This one was pressed hard in my heart. And we haven't touched on in these years the proper understanding, not just of spiritual warfare and the armor of God, but we haven't touched on prayer. And so part of the reason why I picked this subject is because it's very crucial that we understand the biblical doctrine of spiritual warfare and the armor of God. And part of the problem for us is that 
On the one side, there are those that believe in naturalism. This is a, a move that was started by Rudolf Boltman, but, but, but really the idea is this. There are people in our world today that simply do not think Satan exists. They simply don't think that demonic forces exist. And oftentimes Christians live in this way. They don't think that there's a real enemy attacking them. They, they don't think that there's a, a real demonic forces that are trying to pull them away. And so they live a Christian life as if there is no enemy to battle against. That's naturalism. But on the other side of the spectrum, there's what I call, this is my own term, demon blamism. And the idea here is that in the church, there are those that are on the other side which simply blame the devil and demonic forces for everything. And, and so it's the famous phrase, the devil made me do it. It wasn't me, it wasn't my thoughts, it's the devil, the devil made me do it, the devil made me do it. I, 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 I divorced my wife because the devil made me do it. I, I fell into sin because the devil made me do it. I think this way because the devil made me do it. So that's one issue that we need to clarify in this series. But then there are those who have a Hollywood understanding of demons and the powers. And so we think that a demon-possessed person is someone who, like the movie The Exorcist, they're crawling up walls and their head is spinning around all over their head. And so we have that view in mind or films like Chucky or, or movies that depict haunted houses or series that depict haunted houses. We have this notion that demons can, can dwell in objects. And so I look to clarify that understanding. And then, of course, because of our history and because most of you grew up in charismatic teachings on spiritual warfare, there are many believers who have this notion that the battle is out there. And my job is to bind the enemy out there. It's to rebuke the enemy in the city over there. And so we have an out there battle, when in reality, the battle is from this ear to this ear. Satan attacks the mind. He attacks the heart. And so we have this charismatic understanding of warfare, of binding and rebuking, instead of what the biblical text entails. So throughout this series, we're going to be learning what spiritual warfare is, how to battle against the enemy, and that's part of what this text is showing us. In fact, today we'll look at verses 10 and 11, and Ephesians 10 and 11 reminds us that we need the strength of God and His armor to resist the attacks of the enemy. Notice the word. It's to resist, not to attack the enemy, not to defeat the enemy. Ephesians 6, 10, and 11 is teaching us that we are to resist the enemy by strengthening ourselves in God and by putting the armor of God on. Now the question is, why is it that out of all the epistles in the New Testament, Paul begins by talking about spiritual warfare? And the answer, in part, is found in Acts chapter 19. There, there is a cultural context that is vital to understanding the epistle of Ephesians. And in Acts chapter 19, I'll read from verse 21 and on, Paul is in Ephesus. And, and look at the, the culture of Ephesus. Now after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, 
who had silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there's a danger. Not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. I'll stop at verse 28. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. What I want you to see here is these silversmiths in Ephesus are worried because Paul is going throughout the city not rebuking these spirits but preaching the gospel. And as he's proclaiming the gospel, people are coming to Christ. And the threat is Artemis is not going to be worshipped. Artemis was a goddess, and she was worshipped as the supreme cosmic power. In fact, uh, images of her depict her as wearing a, a, a necklace with all the zodiac signs, and the necklace is, is an emphasis that, that she's greater than all the astral deities, that, that she's greater than, than all the zodiac signs, that, that she's more powerful than the stars in the universe, which many people worship as gods and goddesses. And so she's greater than, than them. And, and as we see in, in this text, in verse 28, and then later on in, in verse 34, where there's this notion of, of a riot breaking out, verse 34 says, when they recognized that he, meaning Paul, was a Jew, for about two hours they cried out with one voice, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. In other words, they're worshiping this deity, saying she's greater than the God Paul preaches. They had a missionary zeal. They, they evangelize others to, to worship this God. The Ephesians believed in the powers. They were afraid of the powers. But, but Paul's point in writing about spiritual warfare isn't simply to teach against idol worship. But his point was to emphasize greater than the powers is Christ himself. Paul writes this letter to Ephesus. Paul writes and, and specifically focuses on spiritual warfare. Yes, because the culture is indwelt in it. Yes, because many believers were fearing what could happen to them if, if, if these demons and powers could affect them. But Paul writes to emphasize Christ is greater than these powers. And you and I need to know that. So that's the context of Ephesus. It's a spiritual, it's a supernaturalism culture. They believe in these spirits. And so Paul begins here talking to the church and he says, uh, finally, and I want to stop there. Because there are three options here. It either refers to finally, and Paul is literally ignoring the rest of the letter, everything that he said from chapters 1 through uh, chapter 6, verse 9, and he's ignoring all that, and this means that he's starting a new idea. Or others have the view that finally means that Paul is going back to the exhortation portion, which begins in chapter 4, verse 1, and so he's linking us back to chapter 4, and now he's adding on to that exhortational list. However, the third view is the correct view. Paul says, finally, referring to the whole letter, because in Pauline writing, he always gives indicatives at the beginning of his letters, instructions, the doctrine about the Lord and Christ and salvation. And then in the latter part of the letter, he gives the imperatives 
the exhortations, the way believers ought to live. And when Paul says here, finally, he's not talking about a new thing that's set apart from the letter. No, it's a new subject, but it's linked to the letter. It's connected to the letter. So Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord. What's the doctrine? Well, in chapters 1 through 3, Paul explains the doctrine, and I want us to look at some key passages so we can understand well, what's the doctrine of Ephesians and, and what does it have to do with spiritual warfare. In chapter 1, verse 16, the text says this, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of our hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. In other words, at the beginning of the letter, Paul wants the Ephesians to know, and that's why he says, I want you to know this. What does he want them to know? He wants them to know, as we read here, that the Ephesians should know that Christ's position is above the powers, when he raised them from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the Father in heavenly places above all rule and authority and power. That's the idea. Christ is above the powers. In Ephesus, you must know this. In a culture that, that fears demons, that fears the, the demonic goddesses and gods of the age, Paul says, don't be afraid. Christ is above them. But he doesn't stop there. In Ephesians 2, 4 to 6, this finally is reminding us of what God has done in us. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You see, it isn't simply a church know that Christ is above the powers. No, no, Paul goes beyond that. He says, not only is Christ above the powers, but when he saved you, when he took you out of the, 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 the kingdom of Satan and brought you into the kingdom of Christ, you're seated. Notice the word, it's not future. The text doesn't say you will be seated. It's past tense. It's you're already seated in Christ, in the heavenly places. In other words, just like Christ has authority over the powers those who are in Christ, our union with Christ gives us authority over the powers. And this will be key as we go through this series. But, but Paul doesn't just stop there. It's not just that they should know their position of Christ over the powers. It's not that they should know that their union with Christ places them above the powers. But in the context of the letter, the Ephesians know their responsibility in Christ is to proclaim the gospel. In Ephesians 3, 8 to 10, Paul says to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. In other words, church, you must know, Ephesians must know that Christ is above the powers. In chapter 2, they must know that their union with Christ places them above the powers. And in chapter 3, they must know that their responsibility is to proclaim the gospel 
which is the thing that defeats the powers. Now that's the doctrine. This is what finally is, is, is relating to. But then you get to the living out part, the imperatives. And the imperatives begin in chapter 4, verse 1. So finally ties to doctrine, but it ties to the imperatives. And what's the imperative in Ephesians? Well, it's, it's this word, and you'll see it here. In 4.1 it says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Believers who know who they are in Christ ought to now walk like Christ. And this word walk it comes out through all the imperative sections. So again, in Ephesians 4.17, Paul will say, walk not as the Gentiles do. In other words, don't walk like the world. You are to walk in Christ, maintaining the unity of the Spirit in, in union with Christ. It means that they shouldn't walk like the world does. In Ephesians 5, 1 or 2, Paul tells them to be imitators and to walk as as Christ did in sacrificial love. The text says, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. So union with Christ means that we ought to walk in the love of Christ, in sacrificial love. In Ephesians 5.8, the idea is that you are the light of the world. And so believers are to walk as light. Union with Christ entails walking in light in this dark world. And in Ephesians 5.15 again, Paul will tell the church that they are to walk as wise and not as unwise because the days are evil. The church is living in evil days. And so it's not just simply for Paul that they ought to have the right doctrine about Christ. But right doctrine about Christ means walking like Christ, maintaining unity in the Spirit, walking as light, walking in love, walking in wisdom, not as the Gentiles and as the world walks. This is the context. This is what Paul means by, by, by finally. In other words, if, if you didn't get that, let me put it this way. Chapters 1 through 3 teach us our union with Christ. Chapters 4 to 6, 9 teach us not just the union with Christ, but that we ought to walk like Christ. And now here in chapters 6, 10 through 20, the believers who understand their union with Christ and walk with Christ are now to battle with Christ. If you still haven't gotten it, maybe this analogy will help. Chapters 1 through 3 teach that believers are seated in the heavenly places with Christ. Chapters 4, 6 through 9, the believer is to walk like Christ. And now here in chapters 6, 10 to 20, the believer stands in warfare with Christ. It's all in Christ, you see, for Paul. It's all about Christ. And so how is the believer to stand in spiritual warfare? Well, this is what Ephesians 10 and 11 teaches us. Point number one, the believer is to stand strong in the Lord. Now that we have the context, we get to the text and Paul says, finally, be strong. The phrase, be strong, is an imperative. It's in this imperative section. And not only is the believer to walk, that's also an imperative, but now they are to be strong. And you may be wondering, why is it that when I became a Christian, things seem to have gotten worse? instead of better. And that's the point. Spiritual warfare exists because we are no longer in the enemy's camp. 
When you're in the enemy's camp, Satan doesn't bother you one bit. You're on his team. You're wearing his jersey. But the moment you became children that were under wrath, children that were, that were destined to be in the kingdom of Satan, and the moment you were, you were transferred into by the mercies of Christ, into the kingdom of Christ, into the kingdom of heaven, now the enemy has a problem. And so this notion that if, if you're a Christian, your life is going to be great, your life is going to be awesome, your life's going to be amazing, free of trials and problems, now that's a false ideology. We have an enemy who attacks, and he attacks you specifically because you are in Christ. And so what is the believer to do? They are to be strong. It's a reminder that the battle is not for the weak. This battle, spiritual warfare, is not for the faint-hearted. This battle, spiritual warfare, is not for cowards. It's not for those who are looking to run away, who are looking not to engage in combat. And friend, you need to know this. If you're a believer, whether you want to engage in combat or not, you're in one. Satan engages you. Satan comes to the front line. It's a picture of Goliath going to Israel, to the enemy's camp, and defying the whole nation. Who's going to stand up against me? Whether you want to be in a battle or not, friends, you need to know you're in one. If you're a true believer, Satan is not sitting idly by, waiting for you to get to heaven. No, he is Attacking and attacking and attacking. So you ought to be strong in the Lord. Now notice the text says, in the Lord. It doesn't say, be strong in your mind. It doesn't say, be strong in yourself. It doesn't say, be strong in girl power. Be strong in man power. No, no, no. The text is clear. Believers are to be strong, but strength is found not in themselves. Strength is not found in how they think. Strength is not found in how they feel. No, the text says the strength is found in the Lord. It's all Christ. You see how the doctrine of the book matters. Our union with Christ, our walking like Christ, our standing in warfare is in the Lord, it's with Christ. And most people lose spiritual warfare here because they believe that they're the strong ones. Spiritual warfare is lost here in verse 10 because many believers think, I don't need Christ, I got this. I can do this on my own. I can defeat Satan and the spiritual forces on my own. And here is where Spiritual warfare is lost. Verse 10 has a good news and a bad news. The bad news is you're not strong. I'm going to say that again. The bad news is what well, verse 10 wants us to realize and make no mistake about it. We are to be strong. The battle is for the strong. But the text is telling us we're not strong. That's the bad news. But the good news is Christ is. And so believers know if we're going to stand strong, we don't stand strong apart from Christ. We stand strong with Christ. It's in the Lord. In fact, Paul in this one verse uses three different Greek words for strength. He uses the word endinamu, which means to become strong. That's, that's the first phrase, be strong. That's endinamo, be strong in the Lord and in the strength, kratos. It's the ability to express strength in, in the strength of his might. It's another word for strength. That word is ixis. It's the capability to function effectively in might. So to read it this way, the text says, become strong in the Lord, in his ability to express power and effectively show might. In other words, 
Paul is using three Greek words to emphasize we're not strong, but Christ is. We're weak and defenseless, but Christ is mighty and strong. So believers are to put their strength in the Lord. Who's the Lord? Well, the letter tells us. In Ephesians, the Lord is Christ. Ephesians 1.15 says, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. In the Lord is Jesus. Ephesians 5.20, Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Where should our strength be put? It should be put in Christ. It is the strength of Christ that allows us to stand and resist the enemy. So if you want to resist in spiritual warfare, friend, Paul is being very clear here. We are to stand not in our strength, but in the strength of the Lord. And now that Paul's explained What's the first way to resist the enemy? In verse 11, he shifts to the second way to resist the enemy. And Ephesians 6, verse 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God. Now notice here, the text again is in the imperative. It's put on. It means that believers are responsible to put on the armor. In other words, it's not enough that you know that there's an armor. It's not enough that you know that there are six pieces to the armor. It's not enough to have the knowledge of the armor. Friends, it's not even enough to know that you're in a warfare and need the armor. No, Paul is clear. Christ isn't going to dress us with the armor. It's our responsibility to grab the armor, to clothe ourselves in the armor. And and throughout this series, we'll take each week to explain the pieces of the armor and what it means to put on the armor. But the idea here for Paul is that spiritual warfare is not a let go and let God doctrine. It's not, okay, yeah, Christ is going to fight my battles. I'm just going to sit back and do nothing. No, it's a resistant battle. It's a defensive posture, yes, but it's an active defensive posture. You don't just simply sit back and go, oh, well, it is what it is. Let go, let God. No, believers are to put on the armor of God. In other words, The strength passage emphasized that our weakness is so great, we need to depend on God for strength. And we do so in prayer. We'll see that towards the end of this series. But likewise, we depend on God trusting that His armor helps us resist. So we resist by strengthening ourselves in the Lord And here, point two, the believer resists by putting on the whole armor of God. There are three ideas here about the whole armor of God. Number one, it's the whole armor. Panalopia, the whole entire armor. You don't wake up going, well, today I need the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, but but I don't need the shoes of the gospel of peace or the belt of truth. I'll leave those things out. And tomorrow, I I think I'm going to need the shield of faith. No, no, the idea is you stand resisting the enemy by putting on the whole armor. The whole armor is vital. The whole armor is crucial. Believers need the whole armor of God. So you must put on the whole armor. But it's not just the whole armor, it's also the source. It's of God. 
The armor is God's. Now, most of us, when we read Ephesians 6, 10 to 20, when we look at books of drawings of the armor, whether they be for children or adults, immediately we think that Paul simply and only is focusing on a Roman soldier. In, in fact, uh, Paul was probably in house arrest when he wrote this. And, and, and house arrest in, in, in ancient times, you know, they didn't have ankle bracelets where they could monitor if you're leaving a certain area. So, so in ancient days, if you were under house arrest, literally you were chained up to a soldier. You were chained up, chained up to a, a prison guard. So many people think that Paul is literally looking at this Roman soldier as he's illustrating the armor of God. Now, in part, that's true. But primarily, Paul is not thinking of a Roman soldier. In fact, I believe he's using the Roman soldier to illustrate the divine warrior. Paul's a theologian. The armor is of God. And the Old Testament shows us that, that it's not simply that God builds this armor. That's not what Ephesians is, is saying. That's not what Paul is saying. The reality is, is that in the Old Testament, God himself wears this armor. God himself uses this armor in the Old Testament. Isaiah 11.5, notice the words, righteousness shall be the belt of his waist. Now you see why Paul says the belt of truth and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The word faithfulness, the Greek Septuagint translates as truth because faithfulness entails truth. So Paul having the, the, the context that God wears a belt of faithfulness, righteousness, now the believer is to put on the belt of truth. You see the same armor God wears for battle. He gives to his soldiers. It's of God. Isaiah 59, 17, he, Yahweh, Put on righteousness as a breastplate. What does Ephesians say? It's the breastplate of righteousness. Yahweh put on righteousness as a breastplate. And what? A helmet of salvation on his head. You see again, the divine warrior wears the armor. And the divine warrior gives this armor to his soldiers. Isaiah 52, 7 through 8. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. The idea here is the messenger of Yahweh is bringing good news, but who's actually wearing the shoes? Verse 8. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice together. They sing for joy, for eye to eye they see who? The Lord, Yahweh, has returned to Zion. The messenger gives the good news, but ultimately it's God who's wearing the shoes. He's the one who's actually giving out the good news. Yahweh wears the armor. It's his divine armor. In Isaiah 11, 4, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth and he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. The text in Isaiah doesn't use a sword, but that's the idea. What does Paul say? The sword is the what? The word of God. God doesn't strike with a physical sword. He doesn't have one. His mouth his declaration, his word is the sword. And so we have here five pieces of the armor in the Old Testament. The belt of truth, breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation, shoes of the gospel of peace, and the sword. So what's missing? The shield of faith. And that of all the pieces, as we'll learn, Yahweh has no shield. Why? Because Yahweh is never in danger of being overcome by the enemy. In other words, God don't need a shield to defend himself. 
because he's never threatened by anyone. God does not need a shield for protection because he's never afraid of being overcome by the enemy. Satan himself knows that anything that he does on this earth needs to be signed in permission slip form by God himself. You remember Job? Satan goes up to God and God says, you can do all of this Hurt him, afflict him, take away his family, take away his wealth. You can do all this, but you cannot touch his soul. God don't wear an armor because even his greatest enemy knows that he's under God's sovereignty. Anything that Satan does on this earth must be approved by God himself. And so God doesn't wear a shield. He is our shield. And so when you and I take up the shield of faith, it's a reminder that God is our protector. The point that I want to make here is not simply that we ought to put the whole armor, but we must know that the armor that God himself wears is the armor that we are to wear. So what's the point here? You resist the the enemy with the armor of God. Not with the armor of positive thinking. Not with the armor of self-empowerment. Not with the armor of methods and schemes and, and therapy that the world can provide. No, friends, you wear the armor of God. If you want to resist the enemy, here's the armor. And it's the same armor that God wears. It's the same armor that he gives to us in Christ. If you want to resist the temptations of Satan, the, the, the attacks of the enemy that he brings on our mind, there's only one method to do it. And it's by putting on the whole entire armor of God. William Gurnall, who writes a book specifically on the armor of God, reminds us of the story of David and Goliath. And if you remember in 1 Samuel 17, as David is about to fight Goliath in verse 38 and 39, Saul gives David his armor. And the point that I want you to see here is that one of the things the enemy tries to do is to get us to think that the armor of God does not work. That the armor of God is not effective. And so therefore, we ought to try other armors on. And David quickly realizes as a young man, as he puts this armor on, that he can't walk in it. And I think Gernal is right. We can argue if it's allegorical or not, but I think he's right in making this one connection as an applicational point. That when we put on other armors, not only can we not walk, but we can't resist the enemy effectively. Friends, if you want to fight Satan with other armors, you will lose the battle. If you want to fight the enemy in your own strength, you'll lose. If you want to fight the enemy with with other methods and other armors and, and other things that culture say, friends, you will lose time and time again. There are only two ways to resist the enemy. And that is by strengthening yourself in the Lord and by putting on the armor of God. But there's one other point here. It's not just the whole armor. It's not just the armor of God. But it's what the armor is. And it's this six pieces. The armor contains six pieces and six pieces alone. We'll learn this throughout this series. But but the text tells us this in verse 14. Here are the pieces. It's the belt of truth the breastplate of righteousness, the feet of the gospel of peace, or the shoes of the gospel of peace. It's it's the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. It's those six, nothing else. And sometimes Christians want to get cute with this. 
And so you hear believers say things like, well, you know, the prayer is part of the armor. It's mentioned here, but it's not part of the armor. Paul never says prayer is part of the armor. There are others that say, oh, I got to fast. Because I need to win spiritual warfare. So, so, so I need to fast. You do, but it's not part of the armor. Fasting has nothing to do with the armor of God. And my favorite, oh, today we're going to worship in spiritual warfare. We're, we're going to warfare the enemy with singing friends. Worship was given to exalt God so that the believer could express gratitude towards God. It was never meant to be used as warfare. And so there's a danger in the church to put on worldly armor. But there's also a danger in the church to put on Christian lingo armor. That's not the armor at all. It's these six pieces that the believer needs to put on to resist the enemy. And that's Paul's point. This is what Ephesians 6, 10 to 11 shows us that if you want to resist the enemy, you strengthen yourself in the Lord and you put on his armor. You clothe yourself with Christ. I'll end with this. In Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, Christian, which is the main character of the book, is given an armor. And as he's walking towards the heavenly city, Apollyon, which is Bunyan's depiction of Satan meets him head on. And here's what Bunyan writes in regard to this event. There's Christian and he's staring at his enemy face to face. And here's what Bunyan writes. The sight of him filled Christian with fear. And he began to wonder what he should do. Should he go back in haste or stand his ground, going calmly on his way as if he had no fears? Then it occurred to him that he had no armor for his back and to turn his back on the enemy would give him the opportunity to pierce his back with darts." Friends, what Ephesians 6, 10, and 11 are showing us is retreat is not an option. Bunyan knew this. The armor is depicted as someone viewing it from the front because spiritual warfare is not for the cowards. It's not for those who are looking to run away. Again, friends, whether you realize it or not, you're in a battle and your job is to stand but not to stand in your own strength. Your job is to stand in the strength of the Lord. And friends, your job is to stand not in your own armor, but in the armor of God. And what Ephesians 6, 10, and 11 is guaranteeing is that if you do this, you will withstand the attacks of the enemy. So stand courageously because Christ will defeat Satan. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we continue to learn about spiritual warfare and the armor of God, Father, I pray that you would protect me, that you would protect those listening, as we know that the enemy will not be standing idly by as the true teaching of this doctrine is exposed. But Father, let us not stand in fear. Culture, Hollywood, wants us to be afraid of Satan. And while we ought to recognize that Satan is a foe that we cannot defeat in ourselves, we also should know that we should not be afraid because the one on our side is greater. You are greater, God. Help us this week as temptations come our way, 
as battles with mental illness might even increase, that we would strengthen ourselves in you and that we would put on the whole armor. Help us, Lord, to walk in holiness, to walk in strength in you. Help us to walk with Christ and to stand with Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Church, you are dismissed. Amen.